Good. Good morning, everybody. Wow, are you enjoying the changing of these seasons in Michigan? I was looking at the forecast this week. I think we have an 82 high for one day and a 48 for another day. So welcome to Michigan. And the changing of the seasons is such a neat time to watch the colors beginning to show their flavor and be reminded of the one that created the world is the one that created each of you and created us. And it's overwhelming when you think about that. The focus for today is really flowing out of the life of Jesus and what kind of leader he was, the one who came to save us. And Paul captures it this way. He says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? And this same Savior is the one who made this promise to each of us in terms of who he is. He said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follow, follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And that's the one we've come to worship. Would you stand to receive the Father's greeting? Our Creator, our Father, greets us grace to you and peace from me, your dad. Through Jesus Christ, my Son, your Savior, through the very outpouring of the Holy Spirit who has set up residence in your heart and says, that's my home, and does a shaping work, a character work, and comes upon you in power to be his witnesses, grace and peace to you. And all God's people said, amen. Let's continue in worship. We're going to start out with My Lighthouse. And I know there's motions to this song, but I actually don't know them that well, so I was wondering if there's some kids who would be willing to come up here Stand up in the front and do the motions for us. Come on up, guys. I need your help. For as much as I like to move my hands, I don't really know the motions. There we go. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs>
From Revelation 4. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in the front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being.
coming to come home. That you said, come follow me, and coming to follow you is coming home. And we thank you for that. And we pray that if there are some feeling weary today, they will find refreshment, soothing ointment, breezes that refresh and bring life that you send through your Holy Spirit as we come home to you. We pray this to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So as I've said the last month or so, Matthew chapter 5, <laughs> and we'll continue to hang out there for coming weeks. I continue to have my antenna up to literally every facet of the world in which we live in, at least in our Western culture, especially in America, that has little to do with be, but has everything to do with do. Just do it. Just do it well. Just perform. Just be great. A simple thing like art prize. I love the creativity. I love the arts. I love watching how God takes people and what they put together in a creative way that's astounding and impacting. And yet, only a few people get the big prize because somehow others voted and said they did it right. And so the challenge in the world becomes doing it right. So I'm on the road yesterday and I'm listening to football games. And I'm not a football person, but there wasn't much else on. And it's all about doing. What's the quarterback doing? What's the kicker doing? What's the coach doing? What is everybody doing? And in the end, did we win? And by we, what does it mean? Because quite honestly, it doesn't matter whether I'm a Michigan fan or a Michigan State fan or an Ohio State fan or whoever it is, if my team wins, I didn't have anything to do with playing the game. I didn't take one catch. I didn't throw one ball. I wasn't even allowed on the field. Security would make sure of that but it becomes about the do. And just looking on Facebook this week, I had a little post that came along. I have no idea where it came from, but it even raised my antenna up a little bit more. And it, my paraphrase, it was something like this. It was, so when you think about life, you need plumbers. You need people to clean the restrooms at McDonald's. You need people to cook the food and to serve it. You need cashiers in some places, at the store. That's slowly going away. You need people to take care of your yard. You need people to, and you go down the list of all the people you need. But rarely do we recognize that they are so valued and important because our whole focus is on those who are up front performing. And we really, none of us, don't need a quarterback we really don't need a movie star. We really don't need a star musician. We need people who add value, and that flows out of being. So that's kind of the context out of which I go back to here in these core values for kingdom living as Jesus invites the disciples to go deeper as he had just invited them to come and follow a few verses back. And in time, I'm not sure if that was a few days or a few weeks but here they are ready to step in and find out what does it mean to follow Jesus. And he begins with these core values. And here we are again, I'll read from Matthew chapter 5. As Jesus saw the crowds, he called the disciples to him. They were in that inner circle. They got the front row seats. They were going to have firsthand watch and look not only at the teaching, but at the life of Jesus that would mirror every one of these teachings that we find in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Beatitudes. And here's what he said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So what image comes to your mind when you think about the word meek? Not a word we often use in our vocabulary. But here it is. Even in a word search in Scripture, not a word that showed up very often, a couple of times in a word search. But blessed are the meek. So you're an employer, and you're ready to do a job interview with a person who's filled out an application. And as you glance through their references, you note that there was a comment made by a former boss that said, Brad was a good worker and meek. So you're about ready to meet Brad. Is that reference something that would have you see Brad as strong or weak? Decisive or wavering? Confident or intimidated? Now what in the world are you looking for to fill the job? Or you're walking by a group of people and you hear your name and you know they're talking about you. Anybody ever have that? It's like, oops, and all at once the crowd goes quiet. Is, is kind of interesting. In my first church up in Iowa, there was this little town that everybody would gather in for coffee from the Lutheran Church and the Christian Reformed Church and the Catholic Church. And, and Pastor Tom over at the Lutheran Church and I would often meet up at the coffee shop and we would often notice a silence when we walked into the coffee shop together at 9 a.m. So one day we snuck in before anybody else and we sat in a back booth and there was kind of a wall that they couldn't see us and we slouched down and we had our coffee, and they were all busy talking, and we weren't listening to them, honestly. <laughs> but when we stood up, when we were done with our coffee, it was like there was no voice. <laughs> so what about somebody who's maybe talking about you, and you hear them say, you know, Lynn is a really meek person. Is that a compliment or is that something derogatory? Is it something you value or is it something that is kind of like, I don't want to be a meek person. I want to be a quarterback and I can't play a quarterback if I'm a meek person. And I can't be a leader in a company if I'm a meek person. And I probably won't make a very good parent if I'm a meek person because I'll just enable all my kids to do whatever they want because I won't stand up to them. And the list goes on and on in our preconceived idea of what is it like to be meek? Would you dislike or like a meek person? Would you marry a meek person? Would you trust to follow a meek person? Would you follow a meek person into battle? <laughs> it gets a little bit more intense there. Because the conception we often have and what I grew up in was meek must be weak. There's something that's a flaw in you. Meek is kind of mousy, whatever that means. <laughs> meek is spineless. Meek is nice, but it's not bold. Meek people don't take a stand. They just step back because they're meek. And it's within that context I dig in a little bit deeper and I open my dictionary on my computer and I type in meek and here's what came up most often in today's culture and meaning of the word meek. Deficient in courage. Would you follow somebody deficient in courage? I mean, it seems odd to me in our culture to hear Jesus say, blessed are the deficient in courage, the cowardly, the spineless. So it's good that we don't go down that road. <laughs> That's not at all what Jesus was saying. 
in the Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar, so I depend on others who are Greek scholars to kind of dig in and tell me what the word is saying. There are a couple of meanings in classical Greek for the word meek, and it's actually in Greek the word praos, P-R-A-O-S, just a simple word. And literally, it means gentle or mild or tender. Gentle or mild or tender. And it can be described in a couple of different ways. One is sort of like a soothing medicine or a gentle breeze. I mean, when your throat is sore and burning up and scratchy, you need some soothing medicine, right? You get a burn on your hand and you're headed for the ointment that will cool it down because you need a soothing ointment that will come along and calm down the intensity of the pain that's there. I like that word, prowess. I need soothing ointment physically and emotionally and spiritually in every avenue of my life. And not only is it a soothing ointment, but it's like a gentle breeze. And I love a gentle breeze. Remember in our trip to Israel, we went to the waterfall of Engedi and we're standing under the water and our rabbi says, you better really enjoy this because later today you're going to be wishing for this waterfall. So consider it a blessing from God. Later that day we were hiking out in 115 degree weather. It was a three water bottle journey out. That's how we could tell how far we were going to go. And we're just out in this place that is deathly quiet in the wilderness. It's like a desert. It is hot. It is dry. It is awful climate-wise. And then out of nowhere, as the rabbi was sharing a scripture about God being the one who brings refreshment, out of nowhere comes this little gentle breeze that wisps over us, and we all kind of go, <gasps> because it felt so good. And it was like, how did he do that? <laughs> But there was just that evidence of the Spirit at work reminding us of what this gentle breeze was like. And I believe kingdom people that Jesus is calling the disciples to be and that he was the one who showed them what it was like by his actions. Those kingdom people are like that. They are soothing ointment and gentle breeze. And I really need that. I mean, when I stop saying the right thing and begin confessing the real thing, I need a gentle breeze and a soothing ointment. I don't need condemnation. I don't need people putting me down. I don't need people blaming me. I don't need a lecture. I need a gentle breeze and a soothing ointment. And when I start talking about what's really hurting me and in regards to my sin... I need a community of people where healing comes like a gentle breeze and a soothing ointment. I think it's what James was writing about in chapter 5 when he said, pray for one another and confess your sins that there would be healing. Because healing happens when this prowess is at work, this gentle breeze and this healing ointment. And when we stumble and when we fall and we're hurt and we can't come up with the right answers, Blessed are the meek who come to our side. These are the kingdom people. So that's one application of the word. A second application in the classical Greek is the taming of wild animals. And you may say, what? <laughs> so I'm, I'm reminded of all the backpacking I did when we lived in Montana and spent time in Colorado doing backpacking. And there were times we'd come upon an area where there would be wild horses, and we would just sit on the side of the mountain looking down at the valley and watching the wild horses run around randomly, beautifully, powerfully, playing with each other, just galloping around and having a hilarious time. And yet when you look at those wild animals, those wild horses, they were really worthless. They couldn't pull a plow. Nobody could ride them. All they could really do is eat up your crop or eat up your grass or hang out in your area. 
and rough up the ground. And what they really needed was somebody who would break them. And that's what would happen with wild horses when you take a horse in and you put that bridle in the mouth for the first time and you begin to train it and you begin to teach it how, how, to, how it feels when somebody gets on your back and what happens when you are pulled to the left or pulled to the right or you're told to stop and you listen to the voice commands and there's a breaking that happens that doesn't take away any of the power of the horse. The power hasn't gone from that horse. Still 100% of the energy and the strength but there's something that comes under control, and it's really power under control that flows out of this word meekness. Meek is a powerful word, under control. It isn't derogatory. It isn't slamming people. It isn't pushing them down or putting them away or being discriminatory toward them. It's somebody who has experienced the brokenness that comes when we've gone our own way and understood that we have to surrender to the one who created us and has a plan for us and a future for us. And I think about the breaking that happens in our lives. It's needed so much. I think about Jacob a few weeks ago when we just visited briefly how he was ready to cross over the brook Jabbok and go to see his brother Esau, and he wrestled all night with a figure that we have seen in Scripture to be the one who created him. And in the end, he walked away with a limp, and he had battled hard, but there was something that took place in which there was a brokenness, but a reminder that his God was the one who loved and was watching out for him. And sometimes our mourning takes place. Our grieving, and we're going back a couple of weeks, but it's a part of the flow of what happens in these teachings of Jesus. There can be mourning over a long hidden sin. Like how much of my life did I lose by living in that sin and just keeping a cap on it because I didn't want others to know about it, and now I'm free and I don't have to carry that weight around and I don't have to tell lies to cover up the lies that I was telling about the lies. I don't have to remember all of that. There's a freedom. And it could be that it's just being filled with bitter, angry thoughts about somebody who wronged you. And that can come in really quickly in today's culture. I, I, I wrestle with it when somebody wrongs me. There's a part of me that wants to get back at them. I'm going to teach them a lesson. And that's really a, an inflammatory part of the culture that we live in that seems to be getting even more divisive. If, if you don't believe the way I believe, you're going to pay a price, and you better watch out for me. And we've lost this power under control. It isn't that we're going to find in just a moment. It isn't that we just roll over and we're limp and we're spineless because that tamed horse is not limp and that tamed horse isn't spineless either. But when we have the control that comes, and the control isn't you, the control is the Holy Spirit at work in you. The control is the Holy Spirit doing a work in you. As you often hear me say in the greeting, a shaping work in your life is the Spirit at control giving you all the fruits of the Spirit which you get when you become a follower of Jesus. And as all those fruits are there, the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the loving kindness and the goodness and the faithfulness and the gentleness and the self-control, it's all there. And the Holy Spirit is at work doing this work to help control a broken human culture and a broken human person in a society that is all about doing and all about you and making sure you're on top of the mountain and other people are getting pushed out of the way. There is this power under control that also begins to have us experience what it is to have compassion. It's when somebody else experiences something that you've experienced and many times you can look at a report in the newspaper and you may look at it and just, oh, that happened. Oh, look, somebody died there. They had an auto accident. They hit a tree. If you have a relative that's ever been killed in a car crash, all at once that article reads a whole lot different and your heart goes out to people in ways that otherwise it doesn't go out. There's a gentleness that comes out at that moment. 
For blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. And when we go down into brokenness in mourning, I think we come up meek. We come up with compassion. I know when I was broadsided by that drunk at age 17 and the fought to keep me alive, I still to this day, when I hear a siren, I instantly go to prayer. I have no idea what's going on, but there's this instantaneous reminder of what happened back there so many years ago. And I think it's a part of that work of the Spirit in which you intervene and you intercede and you don't know who it is or what it is, and you also know there's emergency workers who are going to have to take care of a scene that you might want to be in the middle of to take care of somebody. Awful things that they have to walk through, and yet there's this, this desire that God would intervene, and you're there listening for the lead of the Spirit, and you're interceding on their behalf, and there's a compassion that begins to pour out in your life, and ultimately what we need in our lives to be there is a touch of God's Spirit, and I think there's a breaking that happens when that takes place, that we finally give up control to do, or we give up control to do so that we can be at the top of the mountain, or we can be at the top of the company, or we can be at the top of whatever it is in our social circle, circle. but we surrender to the reality. We surrender to the reality that God has given us the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us and lead us to the left and lead us to the right and to stop us at points and to put blinders on our eyes from the distractions that are around us. If we go back to that whole issue of a horse going down the road and the needs that come along the way will, I believe, be a part of rising to the top our compassion level at that point and caring for them because the care of the law that Jesus gives is called love. So meekness is power under control. And at the same time, when we think about power under control, you think about Jesus and the way that he interacted with those in his life because it isn't like you roll over and you don't speak the truth in love. But Jesus, who said, I'm gentle and humble in heart, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, He's like this gentle breeze and he's like this soothing medicine for those who have been beaten and battered. And he's demonstrating this meekness. But this same mild, meek, blissful Jesus, when he's facing the piety of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, he looks at them in anger and is deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he speaks the truth. And these religious leaders, why were they so stubborn? I, I think it was because the glory of God had come to the earth and it wasn't the way they thought it was going to happen. And it took away some of their power and their authority. And it's about the glory of God, and here's Jesus talking about his kingdom and then demonstrating the kingdom in ways they couldn't demonstrate. They couldn't cast out demons. They couldn't bring healing to lame people who had been laying at the temple door for years and years and years. They couldn't stop an issue that a woman had that had her whole life savings gone and she had nothing left and she just touched the cloak of Jesus and there was this healing that took place at that moment. And Jesus is looking at these in deep distression being distressed in their stubborn hearts, and he speaks to it. So just listen to a few uh, lines out of Matthew chapter 23, because there are seven passages that I call woe to passages, and you can look them up later. I'm not going to read all seven right now. But here is Jesus, who we see to be our meek and humble Savior, soothing ointment and a comforting breeze that comes along who also is stepping out and speaking the truth in love. And here's what he has to say in Matthew 23, verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You sought the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter who are trying to. You close the door. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Can you imagine saying that to somebody that you're, you know, speaking to in religious leadership? Woe to you blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by the oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? Woe to you teachers of the law, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, and you have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. And you can keep reading. That's boldness. It's truth in love. It's power under control. And Jesus is really saying, I hate it when people use my name to shut the door to the kingdom of God. And for some people, that's what's happened when they've entered in to a place that has become religious and is more about legalisms, like in the day of Christ, and I think it can happen in today's world. So I was thinking back as I was getting ready for this and kind of marinating it, a conversation I had about a month ago with uh, one of the co-workers at the auction. And uh, and one day he just shared with me a tender moment. He said, you know, uh, I know you're a minister, and I I have to tell you, I don't have a real high regard for ministers or churches. And and so I'd like to talk to you about why and see how you react. He said, "Um, back when I was a teenager, I grew up in a family where mom and dad didn't go to church, and my grandparents didn't go to church, and no one I know of in my family before me ever went to church. But one of my friends invited me to his youth group, and so I went to the youth group, and he lived out in the country. He said, I had to walk across the field to get to the church, and I would have done chores, so I didn't smell real good. And I come in with my jeans to youth group and my muddy boots, and I probably wasn't a real pleasant sight to walk into church because I didn't fit what that church expected of me. And I walked in, I went for two weeks, and the third week that I came, the leader of the youth group said, unless you can clean up, you're not welcome here. And he said, that's the last time I was in a church. Now, I'm not faulting the people there. I'm just saying there was a message that got sent that did not really mirror this meekness that we're looking for, that Jesus is teaching as a core value because we're not about closing the door of the kingdom We're about opening the door of the kingdom. And that doesn't mean license for whatever anyone believes or wants to believe, because we keep going back to the word, which is the truth of God, and we don't want to leave that truth of God, so we speak the truth in love. And, And he's just wrestling here, this young man. He's, you know, I haven't been to a church since then, and... I could just sense this hunger and thirst, like I'm missing something, and I know I'm missing something, but I'm scared to go back. I think that's that challenge I keep feeling in um, loving on people, is there are things that I don't approve of people's lives, there are parts of their lives that I may be disgusted about, but I keep asking, how did Jesus love them? In that passage that I opened up this morning's service with, You're the light of the world, Jesus. When we walk in you, we don't have darkness, but we have the light of life. If you go back to the context of that passage, it's John chapter 8. In the first 11 verses of John chapter 8 is Jesus dealing with a woman who is being tried by these Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders because of her adultery. And they're ready to stone her and put her to death. And they're waiting to see what Jesus is going to say. And Jesus looks at her and he forgives her sin. And after he forgives her sin and says, go and sin no more, (laughs) he speaks that word about I am the light of the world. I've come not to close the kingdom off, but to open the kingdom up as you look to me and who I am and what I have to give to you because I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. 
And there's this nature of Jesus that he'll pounce on the stuff that closes the kingdom. But there's this soothing ointment and this gentle breeze that is evident in who Jesus is. And I think it's what we're called to as we step out. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Incredible. And the challenge is, how do I step out of this place and be that meek person in a volatile culture which doesn't have much to do with meek people, given today's <laughs> definition, but it has such a terribly deep need? Kids are who are just looking for a place that they can call home. I know when we moved to Kentwood, um, our kids went to Kentwood Public Schools partly because we felt called to that as a part of our mission, and I'm not suggesting that anybody else needs to do that. Our, our commitment to Christian education is right up there. We're all the way with it, but our kids were out there at Kentwood Public Schools, and it was a part of our connection into the community that otherwise we wouldn't be connected to. And uh, we ended up with a whole stream of young men entering into our home who, like our youngest son, were wearing their black and their chains hanging down and their piercings and not looking at all like what you would like to have in the basement of your home when they'd come and hang out. But it's where they came and hung out. And what I found out about all these kids is the way they were dressing and the way they were living, they were just screaming out, will somebody love me? Will somebody take care of me? Will somebody pay attention to me? And it was an incredible lesson as we watched that unfold and, and felt so overwhelmed because we couldn't begin to meet all the needs that these kids had. And yet it gave a glimpse into that hunger that there is out there. And that's just one facet of culture. I don't care where I go. A lot of times people who overperform are overperforming because inside there is so much that is weak and shattered and broken and they'll do anything in the world to cover it up because they don't want anybody to see it and they live a life of captivity when what they really need is the freedom that comes through this soothing ointment, through this gentle breeze, through this controlled by the Holy Spirit and it begins with the word surrender. It begins with surrendering and saying, I want the life that comes through Jesus. And I believe it begins, number one, with, we know theologically, the Holy Spirit doing a work in their lives that opens a heart up already to receive it. So who in my life do I need to be praying for that needs to experience the gentle breeze and the soothing ointment? Who needs to come to that point? Not that I'm judging them, but I'm seeing them in misery and they're hungry and thirsty. We'll get to that next week. And in that hunger and thirst, God has put them in relationship with you. And he's put them in relationship with me. And why are they in relationship with me? Because they need a relationship with Jesus, not with me. But I can become to them those arms and that hand and that smile and that encouragement with all those fruits of the Spirit along with the gifts that God might come along and speak a word of knowledge that I get to bring to them and say, I'm just sensing that God may have this for you and we stand next to them and there's a hunger and thirst to be a part of community because they want to be a part of Jesus. And my hope is that as a church, and as a denomination that we're a part of, and for any church, the Church of Hudsonville, people could enter in and know, not that we teach about the love of Jesus, but that we live the love of Jesus. And I see a lot of evidence of that. But in my whole own life, I see a lot of need to grow in that area. Because very quickly, I can get right back into, it's what I do. And God says, I'm just pleased that you're my child. I'm so pleased you're my son, you're my daughter. I love you, I love you, I love you. And Jesus is right there saying, come follow me. Come follow me. And a concluding thought. Although that's dangerous, because I think Paul in the middle of Philippians says, and finally, <laughs> and he's got half the book to go yet. Um, we will inherit the earth. And I don't know that I know exactly what that means. I mean, I've read a number of commentators, and I'm not sure they know what it means. Other than I hear Jesus teaching his disciples in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we become the inheritors. And what we inherit is when we follow Jesus and the Holy Spirit is doing this work of poor in spirit and our mourning and our being meek and the mercy and hunger and thirst after righteousness and the list continues. As the Holy Spirit is doing that work, it impacts how we live life in the world today. It impacts the earth that God has placed us to come in and have dominion over. And we understand that at sin, we relinquished so much to the enemy, but now we're called in because the enemy's been defeated. And in this time of tension of the kingdom already here, but not yet fulfilled all the way, we get to come in and we have a role in God bringing the reality of his love right here on earth to the people he put us in relationship with. And so blessed are the meek. God has put you in places to bring his love, to speak the truth in love, to encourage, to disciple, to walk alongside of, to grab a hand and lead the way as God leads you through his Holy Spirit. And I'm praying that he will bring others around each of us that will do the same as we grow together into him who is our head, Jesus Christ, Ephesians. And every one of us needing each other, every ligament, every part of the body needing each other. And that can only happen with a meek, gentle spirit. It doesn't happen when you feel like you just got rubbed with a piece of sandpaper. And so may God use us to be such a people and may we have a taste of inheriting the kingdom on earth just like it is in heaven to have that taste. Amen? So Lord God, I want to thank you for the promise that we receive that there's a blessing to those who are poor in spirit there's a blessing to those who mourn. There's a blessing, a happiness, literally, a happiness to those who are meek. And with each one, there's a ramification. It's a result, something that happens. It's not something we earn. It flows out of the action as a part of being your kingdom people in a time where people need your kingdom. And we thank you that we get to inherit the earth, that you have given us a place on the earth to serve you, to impact lives, to be in relationship with others. You've given us a, a relationship not to be preachy or judgmental or uh, to build rules about how we'll decide whether we love you or not, but to love unconditionally as you loved. And I pray that as we grow deeper in our following you, that you would continue to do a work that has us increasingly thirsty for more. And even in a, in a week as we prepare for communion, Lord God, that, that there would be a time to surrender and let go of some of the stuff we've been holding on to, let go of all of it that you revealed to us, that we could even come and say, Holy Spirit, will you show me the junk I need to get rid of? Because it's eating away at me and it's keeping me from being a meek person. It's keeping me from tasting what it is to inherit the earth and to know the peace that comes in the time of mourning. And Lord God, would you come and do that work through your Holy Spirit? And will we find great release as we bring it to you? And if we need to confess to another that you would give us a brother or a sister that we have a relationship with, that we could go to and we could spend time emptying the junk out and knowing that there is somebody there who's receiving it with a soothing medicine and a gentle breeze. And may through it all we experience your unconditional love. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, something that I want to share with you guys really quickly, it was from a devotional that I read last week. And this next song is one of my favorite songs. And while I was sitting there, I thought, oh, 
this ties in perfectly with what I read this week, and it, and it really hit me, so I want to just read it really quickly. And it's about, um, about strength and weakness. It says, when he, God, strengthens us, it is not by taking away the sense of weakness and giving in its place the feeling of strength. Not at all. The weakness and the strength are side by side. As the one grows, the other does too. Until his disciples understand the saying, when I am weak, then I am strong. I boast in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then later it says, this person lives a truly joyous and blessed life, not because he is no longer weak, but because being utterly helpless, he consents and expects to have the mighty Savior work in him. And that really struck me that as my weakness grows, his strength in me grows. And I thought, man, I want my weakness to grow. Like, I want to become weaker and weaker because I would much rather have his strength in me than my own strength. So just meditate on that as we sing this next song. seated. I'd like to ask the deacons to come forward. Our offering today is for our general fund and then for our building fund. So Lord God, we pray your blessing on each one here in the way that you've created them, for the way you've gifted them, for the plans you have for them, and as we give now, I pray your blessing on each one. That as they give, there would be a word that goes out from this place as a result. A word that speaks of your love. A word that demonstrates your love. A word that is tangible and real and goes deep and brings freedom. And that's why we give to you, Lord. May you get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you guys stand up? i 
God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace to love him and to serve him.